So first up on the agenda is um, Lou Collins and Sandy Black are going to be um, reviewing template letters and MOU updates. Yes. So first I want to introduce Lou Collins to the group. He has joined us as a consultant to help us with this work. He brings with us great number of years of experience in public school and early childhood special education. So we are very lucky to have him on board. And so you will see him at meetings. And as we keep moving forward, he will be helping support SAUs as well as CDS through this process. Um, in the email sent out last week from Jen, there was a Google folder link. And in that link, there were some template letters that SAUs can use to communicate these changes to different um, constituent groups. So there was a template letter for parents, for contracted providers, and what was the third one, Lou? Parents, providers, referral sources. Oh, referral sources. Yes. Right. Yep. Um, so those are there just for SAUs to use. You can update it, put it on your letterhead. You can change it. This, these were not intended to be verbatim. They're meant for you to just use as um, a starting point to communicate with um, everyone that is now involved in this transition. Um, we have... I'll, move on to the MOU updates. We have met with quite a few districts already this week and we are will be finishing up um, through the rest of the week. Um, those are going wonderful. Districts are coming with their kind of list of ideas that they might have for CDS to help support them as a service hub so moving into next year. We are also in those MOUs clarifying the compensatory education process moving forward. We are clarifying the start date of school since everybody has a different start date. We are talking about um, the next steps in regards to monthly meetings and how that will work for you. And then we're just, um, once those are done, we're explaining that the we will send the SAU, a draft of that. And once you give a thumbs up that we have captured all of the information correctly, you will let Jennifer know. She will then send it through DocuSign for official signatures and you will receive a copy. The other thing that we're telling SAUs at this time is that this is kind of a living document. As things change, as we meet monthly, we are, will be updating it as needed. The other thing is, is that if you need to meet more than monthly, and I know that sounds like a lot, but in the beginning, there might be a lot of questions to be answered. We are more than welcome to set up a meeting. The other thing is, is that you can have um, any one of us at that meeting. So if you want Paula and Ida there to answer some fiscal questions, if we need Kathy Warren at the table to figure out a data piece, if you want whoever it is there, um, we will pull together that team and make that work for you so that we are answering your questions um, in the most expedited way possible. So that's all I have for that update. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, I can pass it on to Susie. She's going to speak about the child outcome summary, which we have been talking about through the MOU process as well. That's awesome, Sandy, thank you. Um, yeah, it's good to have a, a, an introduction to the introduction for this today, because uh, you know, for some people, it might not have been on uh, front of mind that the child outcome summary process is a component of our work. So. I'm happy to share today some information about this. And um, let me pull up all my screens here. One more, there we go. 
So today we're going to be talking about measuring children's outcomes in early childhood special education. And um, can everybody see the screen? Is it there? And okay, great, thanks. And if there's any questions along the way, please uh, feel free to um, stop me, shout them out, or hold them till the end, and uh, we'll see what we can get to. And as always, if there are questions we can't answer in the moment, um, we'll be happy to bring answers to you um, later on in the week. There are, um, so this presentation is going to cover uh, a high level overview of the child outcome summary process. This is a practice that we will be supporting schools to implement that are providing FAPE to children in their catchment areas. Uh, the topics uh, within the child outcome summary process is why do we uh, participate in this? Why are we doing it? Um, the outcome areas that are measured how they measure functional outcomes for preschool age children, how they're anchored to the developmental skills that are expected for a range of ages and stages, and how we work together to assess a child's performance, what the ratings are that are used, and how that data is recorded and shared. The child outcome summary process helps us measure children's progress while in our programs. There are several reasons for collecting information about children's progress. It's a federally required data collection. It's used to determine if the services that are helping make a difference for young children um, are with disabilities. So are they, is what we're doing providing working for them? Uh, the COAST process helps state and local programs to use the results and see how instructional practices are supporting children's development. When a preschool age child is evaluated for special education and is determined eligible and in need of services, the evaluation and subsequent IEP helps the team to better understand the strengths and needs of the child. The child is assessed using the COAST process across three broad categories of development. These outcome categories are positive social emotional skills, which looks at a child's interactions and relationships with adults and peers. Uh, it looks at the acquisition and use of knowledge and skills, which looks at the interest in learning, pre-academics, language and literacy, and engaging in purposeful play. And the third area is called use of appropriate behaviors to meet their needs, and assesses children's uh, child skills with eating, drinking, toileting, dressing, communicating their needs, and navigating the classroom. Um, the link here is if you would like to get a copy of this, uh, it's a, a nice poster to put in classrooms to help remind us of the things that we're um, observing for in preschool classrooms to conduct the COAST process. The child is assessed using a rating on a one to seven scale for each of the three outcome areas. The ratings on the one to seven scale reference the degree to which a child is demonstrating age expected development. So a score of six or seven represents overall age expected functioning. A score of four to five represents some age expected functioning and a score of one to three reflects functioning that is not yet age expected. The first child outcome rating is completed, that's completed is called the entry score. And an exit rating is also completed when the child is no longer eligible for preschool special education, whether by age, is no longer in need of service or moves. When a preschool age child is evaluated for special education and is determined eligible in need of services, the evaluation and subsequent IEP establishes the incoming performance of the child relative to age expectations. These age expectations are published in various assessment tools and teams making COAST ratings must be familiar with and have a common understanding of expected development at the various ages and stages. One example of a tool that represents skills and behaviors by age and outcome area is the age anchoring tool. This one is from North University of North Carolina's Office of Early Learning. Other assessment tools are able to be used to collect outcome scores such as the Brigantz developmental inventory, or the DACI, or the Teaching Strategies Gold platform that's used in Head Start. A list of options will be provided so that schools can choose how to engage in the assessment process that best matches their needs. 
An important factor in the selection of tools is whether the tool that you select can be crosswalked from what are normally developmental domains that are assessed to the three functional outcome areas. So the tools that we will uh, share with you that are able to be crosswalked um, have this component so that they can funnel the assessment items into one of the three categories that we need to report on. The child outcome summary uh, or COAST process is a team-based process. A team of individuals who are familiar with the child consider multiple sources of information about that child's functioning to determine the ratings. The documentation of the child's performance across settings involves parents and other caregiver observations uh, to complete it. Supporting parents, caregivers, and teachers to be knowledgeable about age-expected development helps all team members participate on an equal footing. The team's central question is, does the child ever function in ways that would be considered age-expected with regard to this outcome? Hence the need for understanding of child development across the infant, toddler, and preschool stages. This process can be completed simultaneously with the evaluation and IEP. And so we'll have some resources following up this presentation to be able to conduct it in that manner if that's the way you would like to do it. Once the data is collected on each child, it is submitted to the Maine Department of Education. The Maine Department of Education submits this data in its annual report, the State Performance Plan Annual Performance Report to the federal government. It's important to have common definitions of the data elements and the process of collecting the data. When we talk about an entry score, we're referring to the process and the event. Data to complete the COAST may be gathered during the review of existing data at the multidisciplinary evaluation team meeting or at the initial IEP meeting. The entry data must be collected prior to the onset of services to document the child's performance before intervention. When we talk about an exit score, this is the process of obtain, the process of obtaining the score is similar. It is, however, completed when as a child is about to be discharged from services, either through graduation or transitioning to kindergarten or special education services or moving out of the state. Data is only submitted for all children exiting children who have both an entry and an exit score and has received services for at least six months. Again, we'll be providing additional information about this method for submitting the COAST data on each child who exited during the year. We anticipate some questions about the COAST process and are prepared to offer technical assistance and further professional development. To answer a few more common questions, we have some FAQs. The first one um, on, uh, about on, is about ongoing prog progress monitoring um, and are we required to use the COAST process for all children in the classroom, both with and without disabilities? And the answer is no. The COAST re uh, reflects two point in time assessments of its preschool children with disabilities. And um, uh, however, ongoing progress monitoring is a best practice. Uh, we, it's recommended to help teachers determine, che oops, sorry, yikes. Sorry about that. Um, the COAST process is for um, just for children with disabilities. Um, is there a mandated tool or process for conducting the COAST assessment activities? And the answer is no. Data to complete the COAST should be gathered at the initial evaluation and IEP meeting upon entry and prior to the end of the school year for the exit score. Um, we just expect that practitioners involved in the COAST process have a thorough understanding of the tools and the procedures to gather and submit timely and accurate data. So how do we know if our teams are ready to use the COAST process accurately? There are a variety of trainings and resources available for teams to ensure that they're knowledgeable about the process. As mentioned a moment ago, professional development through the Early Childhood Technical Assistance Center includes online modules, guides, and practice activities. The knowledge check is available to assess practitioner knowledge about the process after the training. A few examples of training available is the COAST online process module, and all of these are clickable links that will take you directly to the resources. Um, some frequently used resources to collect and maintain the data and the um, knowledge check, the link to the, the little test. 
that tells you whether or not your team is ready uh, to conduct the process. Um, school teams, uh, the ECTA offers professional development, as I mentioned, um, modules on the COAST process. The modules are clear, informative, and comprehensive, and result in practitioner competency on the skills of the process. And that link takes you right to them. So that is uh, my quick overview of the COAST process. Are there any initial questions or information that you would like us to follow up with? based on what you've heard so far. Susie, can you stop sharing so that we can see yeah. folks? Yep. Any questions on any of that? It was a very clear presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of the things I just want to acknowledge is that all of you that participated in an IEP meeting to transition a child from CDS to a public school have probably never heard of this information before. You've never discussed it. However, it is federally required. And if you look at the um, outcome summary, it's kind of the basis of every IEP. So we're making some changes in CDS to make sure that that's more prevalent in a conversation that you might have. If, um, you know, it, it for you guys, it won't really, be needed, but for, or if you are using CDS, we're going to be using these um, in language so that we can help you guys understand how to, how this is kind of the basis of everything we do. And yet it hasn't been widely understood or acknowledged in any transition process to a public school prior to now. So um, you are going to want to get your special ed teachers who are working with this age group trained in the um, COS process. The modules are online and self-paced, take about four hours total. And um, it would be great if you could build on some time prior to the beginning of the year for them to go through these modules and then um, do the quick assessment to make sure that they understand this process and how it's embedded in special education. So I just wanted to articulate that because again, CDS has been providing this data to the Aussie team every year, and it's not been widely discussed or known um, to any of the SAUs prior to, prior to now. So we want to kind of bring this to light and understand people's federal requirement around this, our federal requirement to report this. But also, when you look at the COS, it is the basis for everything we do in special education. I mean, it's really, it really is kind of delineating the skills that children need to be successful in school. So I just want to say that as a caveat. And for those special ed directors in the call, you are going to make sure, want to make sure you're IEP coordinators, if you have a if you have a preschool transition coordinator, they're going to have to know this. We are doing training on the assessments. If you partner with Head Start, mo majority of Head Starts in this state use TS Gold, and they're on it. They already do it, and it's because they have to do it for federal reporting as well. So if you have any providers that you're working with, you can have conversations with them. You can elect to adopt that, but just know that more technical assistance is going to be coming and support for actually acquiring those assessments as well. Uh, we're working on that as well and training. So uh, just this is really for your special ed directors on the call to make sure that you're aware that you need to have your staff trained and that we'll be doing some additional work on this. Jen, will you pop the agenda back up on the screen, if you don't mind? I'm um, muted. Leanne. We are on the um, informational section of the agenda right now, Jen. Correct? <laughs> to pull it up again. We are. OK. I'll pull it back up. For some reason, my computer won't let me share the document in the chat. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, and Sandy, you're on for the informational update. Sorry, I thought I was doing it, but you can do it. <laughs> says you. <laughs> okay, so whoop, uh, the next meeting next week is with 
main ASVO. So this is focused on, on business managers, but anyone can attend. And Jen, have we sent out that link? That's been sent out by Maine ASBO, correct? It has been. I, I can also attach the link to this meeting. So you'll have several links in the notes from this meeting to be able to access this information. Yes. So next week, we are not having our traditional cohort one informational meeting because the main ASBO meeting is happening at the same time. And we thought that um, other um, SAU staff would like to join to hear what is being said during that meeting. Um, we are, um, Jen, have you figured out how to post the poll again as well? I haven't, um, I'm going to just end the poll and then I'll relaunch it. And I think everybody will be able to see it again. <laughs> Let's okay. Have we launched a um, Zoom poll to gather some information from SAUs quickly today, um, but knowing that people have come on um, probably after that was um, ended, um, we are, there we go, Jen has launched it again. So if you could take a few seconds and answer those questions, it will help support our, um, and, um, answers to some of the questions that SAUs have had, as well as um, how we are forming our technical assistance for you. Um, one of the big things that we've been gathering is your first day of school, because every school district is starting on a different day, and that is guiding information in the MOU, as well as um, letters from our CDS sites to parents to inform them about the transition of FAPE to the SAU. And we wanted to make sure we had everybody's first day of school for that. Um, oh, also in the poll is a question about when would you like to have this meeting when school starts? Because we're assuming that 10 o'clock on a Wednesday is not gonna be an opportune time and we would wanna move back to three or four o'clock in the afternoon. The second question should be we're really trying to get at, are you offering a full week? Meaning that should be saying 30 to 32 hours of school. And I say that because some full-time school schedules are 30 hours or 32 hours. So really we wanna know, are you offering a full six hour day or six and a half hour day, whatever you do, or are you offering potentially two 15 hour sessions, meaning two half day sessions for your preschoolers? If you could answer question two, are you doing a half day session? I should have probably put said half day or full day sessions for your uh, folks, that would be helpful. I think we've moved on to the Q&A part of our time today. Um, yeah, I wanted to also just one other bullet that I wasn't able to put on here. I have gotten a list of seven individuals who need the 282B conditional certification. If you have not provided me with the name of an individual in your school that needs a 282B certification conditionally, please do let me know. Um, we're working on trying to understand how to make that process effective and efficient. If you are an SAU who potentially isn't, um, who is potentially going to lean on CDS for some of those 282B services, we still recommend you getting someone on your staff who's interested that certification. What I'm doing is um, because we have this, opportunity this year to support um, through our university partnerships training to get to the 282B certification. We're doing a separate track for a condensed um, add-on experience for those who already have a 282 to reach that 282B certification. And we're going to be talking about that. But again, even if you feel like you're going to be relying on 
CDS staff for 280 for special education, it's really a good idea to start thinking right now about staff in your um, schools that might be er interested in getting the certification and even thinking outside the box in terms of an ed tech three who may want to go and get either a bachelor's or a master's degree. Um, be thinking about those folks that you want to kind of elevate that are in your SAU that might want to at this point participate in some um, advanced education to reach that certification that would be free of charge. It's a great opportunity for um, interested folks in your school setting. Sandy? Sandy, I wanted to uh, circle back to the communication letters if I can for just a second. Go ahead. Um, at the very beginning, we talked about the template letters and as you know, the success of any rollout, particularly when change is involved, is how well we communicate. And I know that there are questions out there among providers, among referral sources, among parents. So I think to my public school um, colleagues, it's very crucial in the next several weeks that we try not only to get the, the letters out, but to convey the message that our goal is to make this transition as smooth as possible for parents, for all the providers who are a little nervous right now, uh, and for referral sources, and that they all know that they can contact both us in the public schools and CDS sites with any questions. I think what they really need to know is who do I talk to right now about this change that's happening in a few weeks and maybe putting it on your school websites along with the letters uh, and having CDS sites as well get the word out that talk to us. You know, if you have any questions or concerns, we know the change can be uh, stressful, but we're here to help you. And our goal is to make sure that providers realize that we need them. We do need them. And I've worked with CDS providers for years, um, and I know how nervous they get at the beginning of the school year that their caseloads aren't going to be empty. So the more we are able to communicate effectively with the folks involved, I think the better our chances for success and the less stress you'll feel in the field. And I hope to help uh, any of the school districts and CDS sites with that in the coming months. Hello. I think this is definitely a time that we over communicate to our families and communities regarding this change. Yes. Yeah. I mean, whenever you're going through something new, folks, um, you know, are rightfully nervous. It's their child. In the case of providers, it's their business. In the case of referral sources, they just want to know where do I go next? So the more we uh, are available to answer those questions, the better off we'll be. Lou. Um, we have a couple other things. Jen, can you scroll down a little bit so we can see the parking lot items? We just want to give people a heads up about what we know is sort of coming up. Um, so these are just a couple of items that we've heard uh, kind of coming through. You can also see in the parking lot um, questions related to billing is another place where you can also find information about the main ASBO meeting uh, coming up next week, which will happen again at this time um, in lieu of this meeting. Um, and uh, there's some other information about um, main roads to quality. We know that um, that's providing all of you with a training, a little bit about what the system is. Uh, Nicole Medor, who is from our early learning team, will be uh, providing an update uh, during our August 28th meeting. Um, and we will use the outcomes of your polls that you've just taken to determine sort of the timing of that. But at this point, I believe the plan is to keep the meeting on the 28th at this time, Wednesday at 10 o'clock. Um, and then once we get into the school year in September, we'll look at the poll results to figure out if this is the time or if we move to a different time. Other questions? What questions do people have?
It's a chatty bunch today. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that that I will read this as people don't have any outstanding questions and will reiterate the need to make sure that please you have filled out the poll. Um, it's really crucial for us to be able to move forward both the MOUs, but also with, with our work uh, to provide assistance to all of you. Anything else, Sandy, Aaron, Lou, and- uh, Just that on the main ASBO meeting, we were gonna talk a little bit about main care. Um, some of you have, um, some of you or some of the people working in your SAU have been um, eagerly seeking clarification for main care. So we are um, planning on kind of detailing a concrete, this is what you need to know about main care if you're providing billing document that will be um, released to this group, but also reviewed at the, at the main ASBO meeting. Uh, also, we are completely open to setting up individual appointments if, if that is more helpful for you. Go ahead, Sandy. Yes, and I think um, one thing that we uh, talked about last night as a team behind the scenes was there have been some questions about registering our your new preschool, preschool students. And so our guidance for that is that you would register them just like you would any other student that is coming into your district. Did anybody have any specific questions about registering students that were formerly CDS students? Sue, did you have a question? No, okay. All right, we'll see you next week, those of you who are going to the main ASBO meeting, and then on the 28th, uh, we'll see you. And of course, we're continuing our meetings. Um, and oh, I will say that we have sent a letter to you in regard to the initial payment that you'll be receiving. And um, Paula, I don't know, is she on this call? Yep. So, I don't know if you want to give an update on when that's going to be released, if it's going to be at the end of the week or beginning next week. Well, so the plan is to get the paperwork to DAFS, which is the state department that writes checks. And so we're hoping to get that to them first thing tomorrow, uh, which means, uh, sorry, seven to 10 days for processing. If you have EFT, that's great. That will make it quicker. Uh, if you don't, have your business manager call me and we can set up EFT for your school. <laughs> um, and I was just looking at the agenda uh, for the um, uh, for the main ASBO piece. And right now we're saying, we called it um, billing systems in terms of the question. It's really much more accurate to say the, the we're not talking about billing systems in with main ASBO. We're mainly going to be talking about sort of what's needed around recording expenses and that kind of thing. So yeah, we'll fix that in the in when we send that out, just so we don't confuse anyone, uh, ourselves included. All right. Well, with that, Aaron, everybody else all set? Yep. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, we'll be speaking to you all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Great week. <laughs> Bye.